If a car could be diagnosed with a mental illness, this is probably what it would look like. But what diagnosis? Uh, some mental health professionals may say, oh, it's schizophrenia, it doesn't know what's going on, the madness is ripping it apart. Others may say it's bipolar, uh, half wants to go this way, half wants to go the other. But maybe this little car is depressed, maybe it's anxious or overwrought, Maybe too much is being asked of it. Maybe it's taking on the id, ego, and superego of its driver, Jim Douglas, giving it everything it's got in order to come in first and third place at Yosemite. Maybe this little car is you. Maybe it's me. We're pretty sure that we know what mental illness and suicidality look like, right? Uh, a man or a woman with their head uh, clutched in their hands, slumped against a wall. It, if you Google image depression, that's invariably the stock image that shows up over and over and over again. Fun fact, if you Google image postpartum depression, you'll get an image of a young woman with her back against a wall and a newborn in one hand clutching her head in the other hand. No mean athletic feat by any means. But I think we all know that mental illness is probably a little bit more complicated than that. From 2010 to 2015, I worked at a locked inpatient crisis psychiatric hospital. People experiencing psychiatric emergencies, people who were suicidal, homicidal, unable to care for themselves due to a serious and persistent mental illness, people splitting in half, like this little car. And we were expected to put them back together again. Uh, a little welding, some bondo, a five to nine day stay, an outpatient appointment, seven day prescription, a brown paper bag with their belongings, a bus token, and a hope that their name wouldn't be back on the census again come Monday morning. We were expected to do all that when a lot of us were falling apart ourselves. I started falling apart long before that. Uh, in college, uh, I guess. I mean, I had depression and anxiety as a child, but I wasn't diagnosed because my parents couldn't go there. Uh, but college was where the perfect storm occurred. The placement of the skinny, sensitive Jewish theater major on the dorm hall with all of the jock assholes. <laughs> the genius of residence life. The bullying was relentless and immediate and cruel. And for the first time, I entertained thoughts of suicide, uh, specifically hanging myself in my dorm room so that my tormentors would see it and understand what they had done. I was willing to sacrifice myself to educate these people. It was, in a word, crazy. Fortunately, just having that thought was enough for me to walk my crazy ass down to the counseling center. <laughs> and I basically haven't stopped going to therapy since. I've taken medication since 2012. Does it help? I think so. Have I thought about suicide since college? Well, I would love to be able to stand here tonight and say no but you all look like very nice people, and you're attractive, and you smell good, at least those of you sitting close to the front. So I will have to say, yeah, I have. My Aunt Rena thought about suicide, too. She was living in Israel, living with schizophrenia, and sadly, Rena did more than just think about it. I don't know why, because oftentimes with suicide, there is no why but I do know that my father's youngest sister took her own life in 2004. And I also know that the word suicide is not on her death certificate because, well, you know, died suddenly, died unexpectedly, bullshit. There is oftentimes no suddenly or unexpectedly about it. It just isn't good form to write the word suicide in an obituary. And in Israel, if it's on your death certificate, well, you can't be buried with everyone else. There is a section over here for you. 
and all those other people who have died unexpectedly because we wouldn't want the other corpses to somehow catch suicide. <laughs> when I think about suicide, often referred to in the mental health community as the S word, there's even a film with that title, I often think of three other S words, stigma, shame, and secrecy. If my family of origin had an escutcheon, it would probably be a monkey with six arms and hands so that it could cover its own eyes, ears, and mouth. And the words around the monkey would be stigma, shame, and secrecy. That's who we are. That's how we roll. Well, I'm tired of rolling that way. I roll a different way now, and it isn't silent. In fact, it's very, very loud. So loud, it's often hard to carry on a conversation inside, and yet conversation is what we thrive on. It's the gasoline that powers my 56-year-old stigma-busting machine. That's right, Herbie, the love bug. A symbol of love, hope, peace, perseverance, and heart. Air-cooled, rear-engined heart. I first fell in love with The Love Bug in 1985. The first person to ever show me that film was Aunt Rena on a visit to the United States. A charming little film about a charming little bug with a heart and mind of its own. My heart and mind broke that night. I was instantly obsessed. By the age of nine, I could identify the year that a bug was made from the style of door handle to the size of the tail lights to whether or not the steering wheel had a half horn ring. This niche skill did not help me much in later years when it came time to courting romantic partners. <laughs> My road to permanent love bug acquisition had a couple false starts, but good things take time and money and, strangely, depression. In February of 2017, a 1963 VW Beetle found its way into our driveway and into our hearts. A few weeks earlier, my wife and I had been sitting on the couch together, tearfully discussing our own depression about how things seemed to be getting worse and falling apart all around us, and how Herbie might somehow be a piece of the puzzle. We also talked about how classic cars are for rich, retired people whose 401ks have swelled and ballooned. But sometimes you can't wait when the need is now. My wife turned to me and said, I think it's time for Herbie now. In the beginning, it was a selfish thing. Herbie was for us. He made us feel Good. And yes, the smiles and the waves from passers-by were very nice and sweet, and they started immediately on our first drive. People would ask questions. Is it a stick shift? Is that the original AM radio? How many miles? But after a couple perfunctory automotive questions, the question then became, so what do you do? So I would tell them about the five years that I spent at the psychiatric hospital. I would tell them about the online mental health publication that I work for now. And I would share about my own mental health struggles. And then people started to open up. Their son, their brother, their cousin, their colleague, themselves. Bipolar, schizophrenia, depression, anxiety, addiction, suicide. And then it clicked. If people were this willing to talk to me, a random classic car owner, about such taboo topics, maybe I could just sort of help that conversation along a little bit. Maybe I could become a rolling billboard for something that I felt wasn't getting enough attention, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. So I slapped it all over the rear window of my car, and I drive it. And I drive it. From March to the current day, Herbie and I have logged around 8,000 miles. We go everywhere together. We are inseparable. Winter only slows our roll a little bit, and not because of the cold, but because I can't drive them if they've put salt down on the roads. 
My Herb has already undergone one major reconstructive surgery after a rain-soaked drive from Philadelphia to Rochester revealed major rot happening in the floor and the heater channels. When I arrived at my destination, I opened the door, got out of the car, and went to the back to pick up my suitcase, and I noticed a pool of water about two inches deep behind the driver's seat on the floor of the car. I stared at it, confused, <laughs> the way the owner of a supposedly trained dog stares at dog shit on the living room floor. <laughs> Why is there shit inside my house? <laughs> Why is there water inside my car? And yet there it was. And I thought my drive out suicide days were over. I picked up the phone and I called my friend Merlin, a 23-year-old VW wizard, and it really is his name, The best stories are true. <laughs> and I said, Merlin, what do I do? Save it, sell it, junk it, what? Well, the tagline of Merlin's shop in Sarasota is, no VW should ever die. So I knew what Merlin's answer was going to be. Not quite a year ago, I didn't know Merlin very well. But he was having thoughts of ending his life, and he reached out to me on social media. We talked, we shared, I referred him to the lifeline. Now on the phone with me, he said, you saved my life, now I'm going to save your car's life. Find a way to get it down here and we'll do it together. Herbie rides again. Um, <clears throat> the funny thing about that rain-soaked drive to Rochester when I found the little lake inside my car is a couple hours before, or even a couple minutes before, I thought everything was fine because Herbie didn't look sick, right? Well, a car doesn't have to be splitting in half for there to be a major problem. Same with people. I'm not standing here clutching my head, right? People say to me, oh, Gabe, that car is saving lives. Cars don't save lives. Neither do memes, hashtags, Instagram posts, t-shirts, awareness walks, movies, or TEDx talks. People save lives. Open, empathic, caring people. People who are not afraid to look, people who are not afraid to ask, people who really listen people like my friends at the hospital. I'm just a people. A people who loves the people's car. A person who loves his love bug and wants to do something with it. You have something too. And whatever it is, a skill, a hobby, an interest, an obsession, use it. Whatever it is, use it. Don't be afraid of what makes you stand out or what makes you different. Don't feel stigma or shame. Don't be silent. Be as loud as an old VW. Don't be afraid to say the word suicide. Don't be afraid to ask someone if they're thinking of killing themselves. Don't be afraid if you're thinking about it. You can reach out through an open window, I always drive with my windows open, and take my hand. An older woman in my neighborhood did it once. I was sitting at a red light in Herb, and before I knew what was happening, this woman was standing at the side of my car, tears streaming down her face. She put her hand through the window and took my hand I see this car all the time, she said. Thank you. She walked back to her van that was idling behind me. The light turned green. I went one way, she went the other. I don't know her story, and she doesn't know mine. But I know, and she knows. 
and you know. The more we know and share of each other's stories, the closer we are to becoming the kind of community that many only dream about. Let's stop dreaming and let's start driving. Thank you. Thank you.